Good afternoon to our in-studio guests and our virtual guests, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Johan Fleck. I'm the Senior Director of the Europe Center here at the Atlantic Council. On behalf of the Council, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's panel discussion towards a renewed multilateralism, which in our own multilateral spirit at the Council, we are co-hosting jointly with the Council's Europe Center, our Africa Center, and our Geoeconomic Center, and in partnership with the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. We are here today to explore the priorities for the West's international development strategies and how they all fit together in our engagement around the globe, from Africa to Ukraine and beyond. As Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine has demonstrated, how developments, the future of multilateral systems and the United States and Europe builds together and geopolitics have never been more intertwined. Whether it is the importance of Ukrainian grain to feed the world or our strategic vulnerabilities highlighted by Russia's illegal war, we've been reminded in powerful ways that the United States and Europe not only need to step up their engagement with the broader community of countries, but also need to prove that our vision of the world, of our multilateral system, is fit for purpose. And over the course of 2023, we've already seen a concerted effort to increase engagement with countries from Africa to Asia to Latin America. Top officials from Europe and the United States have made high-profile trips to various regions recently. But as interest in Africa, Latin America, Asia, and beyond grows across Western countries, questions remain beyond the need for engagement. What are the priorities of our global engagement and how do we effectively match these priorities with those of partner countries? How do we move beyond the merely talk of engagement toward joint solutions to the challenges facing partner countries? As both the United States and European governments renew their ties with various regions and countries around the world, what potential is there for transatlantic cooperation? And last but not least, what global structural reforms of the multilateral system are necessary for the success of the development agenda? This conversation today, we hope, can serve as a small step and an opportunity to flesh out some ideas what this cooperation could look like. Joining us today for this discussion are an all-star panel, including Svenja Schulze, Federal Minister for Economic Cooperation and Development of Germany. Ambassador Aaron McKee, Assistant Administrator, heading the Bureau for Europe and Eurasia at USAID. And the Atlantic Council's very own Ambassador Ramayat, Senior Director of the Africa Center and Senior Fellow with the Europe Center. So a warm welcome to our panel. Our discussion today will be moderated by my colleague Charles Litchfield, Deputy Director and C. Boyden Gray, Senior Fellow at our Geoeconomic Center. For those watching virtually, make sure to keep up with our conversation by following us on Twitter, including at AC Europe. And with that, Charles, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thanks, Jörn. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, it saves me some time and effort because our wonderful guests have already been introduced. Um, so we're going to divide this discussion into three parts. First of all, our two guests from uh, the Federal Republic of Germany and from the United States have a statement on their work and their opinions on multilateralism in the 21st century. Uh, then there'll be an opportunity for uh, Rama and me to ask them a few questions and have a conversation. And there will also be questions from the audience. So do prepare questions, those of you watching at home and those of you who are here in the room. You can submit questions and we will ask them to our, to our very special guests. Uh, but first I'd like to turn to you, uh, Minister Schulze. Um, in my preparation for this uh, wonderful panel, I discovered a new long German word, it said, Entwicklungszusammenarbeit, uh, which means, well, development cooperation, but it's, it sounds better in German. Uh, so we'd like to hear a little bit more from you about your plans and the new Africa strategy that Germany has established. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, good afternoon for, to all you all. Shaping the global future together, uh, that is the motto of the uh, Atlantic Council. Um, that uh, could also very well be guide, the guiding principle for uh, German's development policy. So be, because it is clear that the global challenges uh, an international community is facing cannot be dealt with by any country on its own, regardless whether 
it is halting the effects of climate change, uh, conserving biodiversity, uh, promoting uh, global security, or fighting poverty and diseases, these challenges are, are all require us to act together and develop multilateral solutions. And that is why the German government is committed to push for a strong multilateralism. Now, I will present my ministry's new strategy for our multilateral development cooperation uh, this autumn. And it is aimed at strengthening the capacities to act and the crisis response capacities of multilateral organizations. This will enable them to better meet the challenges of our time more and more actively shape our common future. This will require structural reforms. In times of multiple crises, multilateral organizations need to become more effective. One thing they need is reliable funding. You all know that. And they need structures that are transparent, coherent, and effective. And then they also need a clear mandate to not only react to crises, but rather act in a preventive way. I'm working to ensure that multilateral organizations such as the World Bank are geared more towards the protection and provision of global public goods, ensuring, for instance, a stable climate, health, peace, and security. The World Bank, for example, needs to channel its financing more towards the protection of global goods, providing relevant incentives to borrowers, and fully exploit its financing options. To make multilateral organizations fit for the future, Germany is supporting the goals of the UN Secretary General's Common Agenda, the High Level Advisory Board on Effective Multilateralism has put forward interesting proposals for implementation, and I want to contribute to enable the United Nations to act in a more integrated, in a more inclusive manner. Germany is pursuing a global structural policy that advocates a rule-based international order. It is aimed at protecting global goods, making countries more resilient, and facilitate, facilitate sustainable development. However, global structural policy is nothing we can drive forward alone, and that is why Germany is seeking to join forces with like-minded partners, especially, especially in the US. And I am in close contact with Janet Jellen and Samantha Power to advance issues, issues such as the World Bank reform, international financing of climate protection and adaptation, and the stabilization of fragile states. This point is to find, the point is to find joint responses to the challenges of today and of tomorrow. And this is where the German government relies on the transatlantic alliance and other international alliances. The African countries, in particular, are key partners when it comes to addressing global challenges. Africa is a growing and changing enormously, and this also entails geopolitical, economic, and social transformations. And that is why I, as the German development minister, have formulated a new Africa strategy. It puts the development goal that the African Union has its, it set itself center stage and provides structural support. It is our goal to support our partners in Africa in their efforts to provide better living conditions and reliable prospects for the future of their people. Through its development policy, Germany wants to set the course for more climate action, sustainability, and social cohesion. And that is in the interest of our partners in Africa and also in Germany's and the global interests. I was in Mali recently, uh, together with the German Defense Minister Boris Pistorius. The Dahl region is currently uh, experiencing one of the fastest growing movements of refugees and internally displaced uh, people in the world, we are seeing how important it is to take preventive action. And that means working through civil engagements, through development policy, to create opportunities that counter insecurity and terrorism. We, the international community, need to show the people in that region 
that we will not leave them behind, that we walk our talk. We are working together to develop sustainable cross-border solutions. And that is why I want to work for under the framework of the Sahel Alliance. And that is why I will stand as a candidate for the chair of the Sahel Alliance. These are key levers the German government wants to pull together with the American partners and partners worldwide aimed at shaping the global future together. And I'm happy to take your questions and uh, look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, there will certainly be very many questions. Before we get to those, we'd like to hear from Ambassador McKee, which joins us from USAID, um, about your take, Ambassador, on the US stance on multilateralism and trying to give it a new lease of life in the 21st century. Sure. Thank you very much, and good afternoon. It's an honor to be with you here today. And uh, USAID is proud to partner with Germany and all of our allies across the globe to ensure greater prosperity and security for all. We are all in this together, and I think that's a fundamental element and core of the approach to multilateralism, that we are stronger together. And we cannot singularly, nation by nation, bilaterally solve the global challenges that we face, which are more acute today than we've seen in, in any lifetime, whether it's building resilience and health systems for the next pandemic as it emerges, uh, getting smarter about how we cultivate food for not just this uh, current uh, impact of the global insecurity that we see in Africa but across the globe, which has been exacerbated by Putin's aggression in Ukraine, but that we are smarter about how we ensure food security for the future, including and, and most importantly, uh, preparing for the shocks of climate change, as we know that those will affect both planting, harvesting cycles, as well as weather patterns and, and all of the other elements around the world that um, are, are girding themselves as we see these shocks as they come to the system. So I think uh, we recognize that in the 21st century, uh, uh, support alone, development alone, um, is is not the best tool in our foreign policy or national security toolkits. And um, as I as I mentioned at the outset, I think we are stronger together. And a recommitment to multi multilateralism has been a key principle of the United States, uh, particularly since the start of the Biden Harris administration. A renewed uh, intentionality and focus on uh, recognizing that we cannot singularly solve these problems. And the multilateral nature of the response to Russia's war on Ukraine has only deepened our commitment to working with our partners to strengthen and support a multilateral system that is, as the minister said, effective, responsive, accountable, more agile, frankly, um, given the uh, pace at which we see shocks to the system and the crises that emerge around the world. Um, and this must be, as we move forward in the 21st century, uh, based on the principles embodied in the UN Charter. Um, and this is where I think we all need to do more to uh, show that the multilateral system can be responsive and is helping to address the impacts that we see, whether it's the shocks or the disruption to the supply chain as a result of COVID and how we need to rethink access to critical inputs that are vital for saving lives, but also uh, preserving and protecting livelihoods. Um, and so uh, I know that uh, since USAID's founding more than 60 years ago, we have helped tackle many of the challenges of our time. Development is the, the, the core of, of why we're here, and we recognize it as a critical tool to, to not just help others, but frankly help uh, uh, countries around the world um, realize their full potential and become critical partners uh, on the global stage economically um, and uh, obviously as uh, uh, contributors to and solutions for the challenges that we see. They shouldn't all emanate from uh, one country or one body. And we've seen, as we've uh, successfully learned from this work over six decades, what it takes to lift communities out of poverty, push back against oppression, and secure peace after conflict. But as we know, and that's why we're here today, there's still <clears throat> additional progress that must be made. And I think that at the core of what we see in terms of stability or instability and fragility and building the resilience uh, within countries, whether it's health system strengthening or being able to weather the shocks of climate change, 
um, that we must focus on uh, at its core and heart good governance and supporting the capacity of those institutions to be able to help their people domestically as, as you said at the outset um, you know we're in this together and it's not that we're coming in to solve problems but that we collectively can help countries build their own capability capacity within their context because they know best to solve those problems there's themselves and so to, in order to strengthen those institutions and the fundamental tenets that we know are so important to the people to believe in both systems, whether multilaterally or even their own governments, is to root out uh, corruption and the corrosive effects and, and impacts that we see, whether it's theft and kleptocracy um, at a sort of a national level, but to strengthen the, the conditions by which our support, our partnership, development resources, or uh, multilateral development banks or other investments can be both secured and have the greatest impact that the people deserve. And so we are wholly committed, as, as um, I'm sure you're all aware, that, um, to the MDB, the multi-development bank reforms. Um, and uh, we have long viewed as central, the, the MDBs, I'll use the short form, um, as central to uh, the development landscape and certainly no more uh, acutely as we uh, were discussing earlier um, as part of the solution set when we look towards the uh, conclusion of the conflict in Ukraine, which takes about, I don't know, 75% of my day every day, um, if not 90, um, for recovery and reconstruction because uh, the future of uh, the outcome of that conflict and, and Ukraine's sovereignty and uh, democracy and ability to continue to produce and be a breadbasket, frankly, for the world um, has implications not for not just for Ukraine, not just for Europe and Eurasia, but for the entire planet. Well, thank you very much. Sure. So now we have a whole host of subjects to uh, discuss. <laughs> sure. Reform of the MDB system, <coughs> uh, sense that we're all in this together, and so we should um, we should organize our cooperation slightly better, although there is a lot of cooperation going on. Yeah. Um, some suggestions that I picked out in both of your speeches on exactly what these reforms uh, should look like. Um, but we've also focused on somewhat different geographies in both of your statements. Um, uh, Minister Schulze talked about the new Africa strategy, which we'll come back to. Uh, you, Ambassador, focus on Europe and Eurasia. Ukraine takes up a lot of your time. There are links between all of these yeah. subjects, and we'll come back to the food security topic. Uh, but I wanted to give Rama an opportunity to ask Minister Schulze a question. Minister Schulze, uh, welcome uh, to the Atlantic Council and to Washington. Um, um, so, uh, thank you, Charles, uh, for this opportunity. I would like to focus, uh, Minister, my uh, uh, first question on, on the African continent. Um, I'm here in two capacities, a senior fellow of the Europe Center, but also a director of the Africa Center. And you, you, you talked a lot about the, the, the continent in your uh, preliminary speech. So, um, at the Africa Center, um, we try to... Um, introduce the continent as a land of opportunities yes. uh, more than a land of threats. Um, it is the, the oldest continent in the world, uh, the youngest. Um, by 2050, the most populous, 2.5 billion people. It's, the, it's a very dynamic continent in terms of, um, um, of GDP. Uh, President Adesina from the Africa Development Bank just said that five of 10 fastest growing economies in the world are again African countries mm -hmm. uh, with a GDP growth rate of 4%. Um, of uh, the rest of the world is 2.7%. Uh, mm. It's also um, the biggest digital, the home of the biggest digital revolution in the last two decades. Uh, they are building the largest free trade area in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a growing middle class and it's the hub for green technology. So you understand why I'm saying opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and it seems that Germany is back on the continent um, with the war in Ukraine and the problems of supply, of energy supply. But even before that, uh, I remember a poor asking Africans, um, African business leaders, uh, what are their favorite uh, companies in the world. And the first to, to come out from this list were German uh, mm. companies. Yeah. So it means that you have a reputation to, to defend and to promote there. Um, and your new uh, strategy uh, for Africa, maybe 
to speak like Americans with Africa um, is, uh, is timely. Uh, you promise assistance, a new side plan, um, and you mentioned the necessity to limit the migrations to, uh, to Europe. Uh, of course, if Africa succeeds, uh, it would be important for Africa and for Europe too. Mm. Um, I would like to, to, to ask you one question about the way, the, the methodology, and maybe the paradigm, because that's um, maybe the difference between Europe and Africa. Uh, Africans are waiting for a change of paradigm. Um, um, and uh, let me take just one example, climate issues. It's, mm. it's very important mm. for energy and for, yes. for the global warming. And uh, we are heading to the COP28 in Dubai uh, in a few months. And everybody's talking about critical minerals. Mm. And you know how it is important for, uh, for, for, for cars, for you know, electric car, et cetera. Yeah. And you in Germany, you have a, a strong reputation there too. Um, but everybody's talking about securing supply chains. Like how can we do our best to take these critical minerals from Africa and bring them <laughs> In, 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 the we, we, uh, in the richest uh, countries in the world. But nobody is asking how can they support Africans to take advantage of their own resources through uh, creating value, creating jobs uh, that mm. are critically important for Africans. And it's also a way to limit the risk and instability on the continent. So do you have um, a vision of, of, of that first? And my second question all still related to climate is, um, there is this idea, global idea in the Western world to defend everything related to fossil energy, etc., which is uh, understandable, including gas. Or gas is seen by Africans as a transition energy. Mm -hmm. The choice for Africans is not between fossil and green, but between life and death. And there are six million people who need electricity. So how can you put the development issue at the same level as the fight against global, global warming? Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> Minister Schulzen. <laughs> that is a lot of question in But one. It's, yeah. it's climate. It's climate. Yeah. It's a lot related <laughs> to climate, yes. Uh, first of all, I, I like to underline, I see and we see the African continent also as a land of opportunities. And I think what we need to change is the political style and the attitude. Our chancellor always said, this is a matter of respect and seeing that uh, uh, the African continent is our key partner in, in tackling challenges as, as poverty, as, as climate change, as pandemics, as security. So uh, having this uh, attitude of respect on uh, seeing what, uh, what this country is able to do uh, that we have uh, interest, uh, that the, the African states have interest and they articulate these interests very well. And we also have interest and need to articulate them. So we do that, we stand for human rights, for international law, for uh, we have a clear value-driven uh, policy of interest. Uh, we do not want to have uh, child labor in the products we buy uh, on the African continent. As such things we need to, to talk about. Right. So, and that is talk between partners. On, um, you mentioned it before, it is key for us to have also a, a business context to the African continent uh, that, that remains central. Mm -hmm. The African continent needs to build 20 million jobs a year for all the young people. Yeah. And we are interested in uh, having also an exchange of experts uh, with the African continent, having um, having business contact with the African continent. And yes, we also want to buy cobalt, lithium, all these products. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. we, we, are, uh, we say, okay, we want to buy that, but we don't want to have child labor in it. We don't want to destroy the environment mm -hmm. by, by getting it. So let us, have some, let us build a partnership, how that is possible and how you uh, on the African continent get also uh, uh, jobs with that, having, um, yeah, yeah, being part of uh, that. It's not new colonialism because of uh, renewable energies for the world. It is about uh, developing uh, also African states uh, in a way that they, they, that they have jobs, that they have, uh, yeah, that they, they, they could uh, um, develop their own country. So that is in the, in the, the middle of that vision. 
And yes, we want the world to get rid of CO2. And our own way is to gas. We, we use gas as a bridge. Um, but if it's possible to skip out that bridge, don't use it because you build a new system. And um, knowing it mm. is much cheaper to invest in renewable energies, then it, I think it is our task to help to get the direct way to renewables, if it's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, because it is a cheaper way, it is a sustainable way. Um, 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 what that, that's what we're doing, for example, with the, with the Just Energy Transition Partnership right. to, together with South Africa, for example, helping them to get, uh, phase out coal and um, um, at the same time creating new jobs in renewable energies, because it is also about the people. You need jobs for the people there. Uh, they work uh, related to coal mm -hmm. in, in the region. So uh, we need to show that we are able to have a socially just transition. Uh, so and if it's possible to skip out gas, fine. Uh, a lot of countries in the African continent need gas to build uh, for, um, uh, uh, fertilizers at yeah. first step, mm -hmm. not for energy, uh, but for, for, uh, for fighting against hunger and uh, growing um, their, their own food. Um, but uh, that is what I think to your questions with the gas. It is mm -hmm. a bridge, but if it's possible to go the direct way, we will help to do so. Thank you, Minister. Um, I think Ambassador McKee, while you don't work on Africa, no. you're an ambassador, so you're used to having extraordinary <laughs> plenipotentiary duties representing the United States, and <laughs> the administration has a new Africa strategy yes, as well. Yes, they do. So and what is your response to uh, Germany's strategy? Uh, or what, how, how can the US strategy complement Germany's strategy? So uh, I heard in uh, the minister's outline so much, so much commonality, which means, which is a good outgrowth of working together because you identify um, not only common ground, but common objectives and goals. And yes, we do have a, a strategy toward sub-Saharan Africa um, that seeks to include and elevate African voices um, in the most consequential global conversations. And we hope if at the end of our strategy, it will have laid the true foundation and groundwork for a partnership with African nations uh, fostered and based on mutual respect, strong economic and security ties, and a promotion of uh, respect for human rights and uh, rule of law for all people. Um, it recasts, so this is important. It's not just dusting off previous strategies. It is a new approach mm. um, in taking you know, our traditional US policy priorities democracy, governance, peace and security, trade and investment and development. It's recast them as pathways to bolster the region's ability to be able to solve global problems alongside the United States. Again, mm -hmm. not parachuting in and dictating and describing uh, what you should do, but listening and understanding what is most appropriate in that context. What sector remains the most undeveloped but is the most promising for trade? And let's explore that together fundamentally including regard for human rights and ensuring there's no child labor and all of the other issues that you mentioned. There are just four objectives, if I may, uh, in, in concert with our regional partners that we're looking at over the next five years. And the first and foremost is to foster openness and open societies. The second is to deliver democratic and security dividends. We can talk about democratic values. We can talk about peace, freedom, sovereignty, and uh, all of the things that we hold so dear. But we need to demonstrate to the people what that means and that it actually delivers so that they have faith and confidence in that system going forward so that back to not only sustainability, I would characterize that, that, it. That is the better system. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But that it endures, right? The third is to advance pandemic recovery. Um, and building on, frankly, the, the tremendous global investments in response to the pandemic, looking at health systems strengthening overall so that we are stronger and better and able to respond to the next outbreak wherever it may emerge, but and economic opportunity enmeshed in that. And then the fourth is what you touched on, Ambassador, which is at, uh, support conservation, climate adapt adaptation, and a just energy transition. Mm -hmm. And I reinforce just so that we don't shift from one system to another as we, sorry, as we've learned from our lessons in uh, Europe and Eurasia. You don't want to create a system that is open for kleptocrats and does not serve its people. 
moving to renewables is certainly uh, a key element of that, but it, you have to look at where countries are in their development state, mm -hmm. where they need their energy generation from, and what makes sense along that trajectory. So we are committed to working with our partners, allies, and most importantly, with our uh, partner countries in Africa to realize, hopefully, those goals. Yeah. Curious to see if Ambassador Rad has any response to that, but before that, I do need to tell the audience that we are welcoming your questions via the chat button in the Zoom chat if you're there, and in the audience there'll be a pad being passed around, so please do submit questions. I'm sure you have many for all of our guests. Rad. Yeah, just one question, Ambassador. You, you, you said uh, that you are in charge uh, in, in Asian, um, of Asia, Asian countries. Europe um, and Eurasia. In Europe, in, exactly. And um, it makes me think about, uh, about China. When I arrived in Washington, uh, the first place, um, everybody, uh, when we talked about Africa, everybody mentioned China. Or if you wanted to interest people to Africa, you have to speak about China. So in now, two years after, it's pretty taboo uh, to mention uh, China when you talked about uh, when it comes to Africa, because the US is trying to have uh, its own policy to Africa no matter Chinese or not Chinese. And that's a good, uh, a smart and good move. And I, I, I just would like to, to ask you about, um, you know, this other multilateral system, because we are in a discussion about multilateralism. Um, Chinese and Russians are trying to, uh, to build. Um, and, uh, and to do this, they rely on uh, African countries. Yeah. Look, the BRICS, uh, chaired this year by South Africa. Um, so my, my question is, um, instead of maybe um, asking Africans to, uh, to forget Chinese or, or Russians, uh, shouldn't it be uh, more effective to work on our own multilateral system, uh, which means the G20, uh, the reforms of Bretton Woods, um, the, um, the Security Council, the, the, the permanent seats. Um, and, and, and then, through these kind of moves or, re or reforms, uh, support African nations in having more space um, in these international bodies. Um, and then, um, you know, otherwise, maybe they will be more um, uh, you know, they will e be more eager to turn to, 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 to the other alternative system the others are trying to build. What do you think about that? And I, I think it's a question for both of you because, um, I mean, it's, it's your job is complicated because you have a leading role in, in, in defining this multilateral system and you have to put together many interests. Um, and, and, and I... I, I I know that President Biden wanted to, to work on that. And uh, in this place, we hosted a lot of events around with the Economic Center, the Bretton Woods Reform. So what is your opinion about uh, an African voice in these bodies? So tough questions from Rama, and I'll add an even tougher <laughs> one. Uh, coming from the Geo Economic Center, I like to use numbers. Uh, so the US and Germany have generous um, aid policies. and. Uh, Various countries claim that they want to follow the 0.7 target. I think both of both the U.S. and Germany are, are close to it, um, which not all Western countries can say for themselves, which is, which is a good thing. Uh, but then, once you, once you have a limit to your capacities, um, so surely it imposes uh, choices on which areas you focused on, both thematic and geographic. And already today, we've covered Africa. We've covered. The Middle East, we've covered, or we've mentioned the Middle East by food security. We've talked about Ukraine. There are many others. Ambassador McKee, you were based in the South Pacific for a long time, which is another big area of focus for the mm -hmm. United States and for Europe. Um, so how do we deal with the finite resources? So now you have even more complicated questions. Uh, Institutions, yeah, right. openness, <laughs> yeah. uh, bringing these uh, countries who we want to work with on development into a conversation <laughs> on institutions, and also finite resources in terms of money. How do we, how do, we do it? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'd like to touch on, before we chart a way forward, I want to touch on uh, one element that you raised, and that is about uh, the perception of malign actors, whether it's the People's Republic of China, obviously yeah. the Kremlin, uh, other state-sponsored uh, acts that try to undermine uh, systems and, and stability in various countries. And I think um, w what's important what will be important as we look at uh, uh, 
modernizing multilateralism and certainly looking at the reform efforts that I know are a top priority for the MDBs is that it's that we not create par parallel systems mm -hmm. right and that it's not necessarily uh, that we need to compete with it, one, with each other I think the fundamental success of ensuring a nation's sovereignty and ability and capability and capacity to make choices about whom they partner with who they choose to invest with who they choose to trade with is a fundamental signal of a healthy, vibrant democracy. We would never tell a nation that they can't have a choice on who to partner with, who to invest with, who to trade with, and who to grow with. We certainly believe that democracies um, and transparent, vibrant societies uh, like Germany, like the United States, um, offer greater opportunity for uh, growth transparency, accountability, and a brighter future than authoritarian or other models of government. Um, but we would never say you can't. We would never say forget about China. We would just hope that uh, uh, countries have the capability to make an informed choice and that that strategic choice is in the long-term interests of their people and the development of their country, not for short-term gains or pockets for individuals who happen to be in power at the moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can absolutely underline that because uh, we need to cooperate with China in a way to solve the global problems. Uh, we can't solve the problem of uh, climate change without China. Correct. So there's still a cooperation needed. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, and in the development question, we want uh, the developing countries to choose us for their cooperation. And I think that is something that, is, uh, that I miss in the discussion. Uh, uh, the countries take their choice, and we need to be the better uh, solutions yeah. for them, and not say, you are not allowed to, to work with China. No, they decide by themselves, and we need to be the better solution. We need to offer a better uh, cooperation in that, and uh, be transparent, be, um, 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 yeah, be the, the, the better uh, partner in that. And that is uh, what, what I like uh, to show also with the African strategy and in all our cooperation here. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the question of money, it okay. is always hard. But uh, we will not have enough public money to solve all the problems. Uh, that is, you, you know the numbers. It is impossible to do that all with public money. So we need to be as effective as possible with the public money. That is why we drive forward mm -hmm. together a reform, for example, of the World Bank. We want the, the World right. Bank to be a better bank, to take into uh, account uh, that there are global public goods uh, that they need uh, to, to, uh, to help to save these goods. It's not about fighting against poverty only, but also about greening the world. Mm -hmm. and therefore, the World Bank needs to help. Um, that. Therefore, they need to change uh, right. their structures. They need to be... Um, they, they need to take pu global public goods into their DNA uh, in the way they, they work uh, in, a, in all their projects, not only in a small part of it. So uh, okay. that is what would, would we both in the US and, and Germany... Yeah, so could you give us an example of a public good that you think the World Bank should be yes, this is Yes, this is climate change, for example. If you fight against poverty today, you can't do that without taking into account that there is climate change in the global south and they are hit much harder uh, than in the global north. That, um, that you can't do agriculture in the same way as ten, than 10 years ago. You need to change that. Um, you need to take into account that there may be, be floods or droughts, so you need to build an, a totally different uh, uh, irrigation system. Um, taking that in the, into account and having a more um, coherent approach, not only have a project, 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 uh, seeing um, the, the, the needs of the people in, in these regions, uh, that means uh, to, to change or to, to bring it in the DNA of a transformational bank. Um, the money questions, we need to be, to be better in organizing also private money, and that means uh, uh, having the right conditions or for, for private, uh, the private sector to invest. It is easier to say than to, to, to do so, 
but uh, the public money is not enough. And for example, in um, renewable energies, it is possible to have private investors on right. board if you have the right conditions, if um, there is a clear uh, legal framework, uh, if there is, uh, if they have the, 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 the investors has a safe space uh, where they right. are able to, to invest. So, and that is something we also need to um, drive forward that, that such investments are possible. Yes, I would jump in and say that in addition to sort of that stability and enabling yeah. environment, uh, with the increase of, of shocks to our systems, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you know, social protection is a key component. So my, you know, one of my, our fundamental recommendations is that that be a, a critical factor. And when we talk about social protection, um, it's social protection in the, in the 21st century. And that means it's a comprehensive risk management strategy that touches or where individuals, households, communities, governments, and the systems can identify their risk exposure and prepare for how to manage those risks. Mm -hmm. that, that protection embedded in investment, in finance, in development uh, programming, mm -hmm. in partnership writ large, uh, goes back to the original point, and that is, is that uh, with eyes wide open and the capability to be able to identify and mitigate, you'll make smarter choices yep. about where, who you partner with, where you invest, and where those resources yeah. can go, whether you're an individual or a country. Mm -hmm. okay. and can I, maybe I could add these mm -hmm. social protection <laughs> systems. We, we delivered together this uh, global shield against yes. climate risk. We developed mm -hmm. that with the V20, with the finance ministers yep. of the uh, most vulnerable, uh, vulnerable states. And this global shield against climate risk, that uh, is, um, uh, delivers um, solutions mm -hmm. for uh, the pioneer countries that, that were selected. Uh, that are fit to the problems from of the countries that mm -hmm. are not not one size fits in all, but a customized solution. Of, for example, for Pakistan, where we start with. Right. So, uh, having um, the the social protection system on board before the problems is, but the problem is there. Mm -hmm. That is really important, and that is what we lack now and what we need to establish. Right. Because the crises, they, they the next crisis on is, and we can see it. So you need more resilient societies, mm -hmm. right. uh, and that is about social protection systems. Okay, we have 18 minutes left. Oh, I okay. think Rama, okay. has, <laughs> Rama, has a, Rama has a question for you. We do want to talk about Ukraine specifically, and then we will go to the uh, uh, Q&A. So, yeah. Rama. Yeah, quick question, uh, Minister, um, with my European hat, or even French hat, uh, the, the, the French-German um, couple about the Sahel. I would like to talk about Sahel. Early May, you launched um, uh, a new strategy for the Sahel, the Sahel uh, Plus Initiative. Yeah. Um, at the very moment when French are withdrawing with Barkhane from the Sahel. How can you explain this move? Um, and um, are you working together on, on the Sahel? Uh, because it seems to me that what you suggest is very interesting. You, you want to, to uh, insist on the civilian the civilian uh, dimension, um, not only military or security answer, but also you, to try, you, you are trying to, to, to take into consideration uh, the needs from the populations. And you, maybe because you are a minister of, of development, you insist a lot on the development needs of the populations. Um, so why this, this involvement in the Sahel from, from Germany? Yeah, the, the Sahel region is, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and then also the Sahel, and also the neighboring uh, coastal uh, countries. Mm. Uh, yeah. That is one region, if you look at the problems there. Uh, they face a lot of challenges at the moment. And uh, these challenges um, are um, a lot of terrorism. Um, it is a yeah. very, very young population, and half of the country is uh, um, below 15, half. Uh, and there is. Yeah, and the, the, these young people need a future. They need jobs. And the only one who offers money at the moment are terrorist organizations. So we need to tackle the roots of the problems. Mm -hmm. And the roots of the problems are um, there is no social protection system. Right. We discussed that before. We, we, we are on the way to establish something. We, with the Sahel Alliance, we, we are in a good way. but. Is still uh, not for, for uh, everybody in the region. So we need social protection systems. We need a perspective for so the young people. This is uh, you helping up with the te technical assistance on social protection systems. Yes. And is there any direct financing? 
there is also financing from the, from the international donors. We have an alliance of all the donors in the region. We are 18 of that. We are 18 states and UN organizations who are in the region. And to coordinate our work better, we have the SAL Alliance. And uh, I, I, um, I think this coordination in the region is, is very, very important. So I announced my candidacy for the SAL Alliance. Uh, um, because I think we need to do our job better in the region. We need to show that we are able to coordinate ourselves as the ones who, who give money, that we are able to discuss with the regions and the, the, the needs of the people there uh, and, and deliver what is, what is needed. And that is jobs, uh, mostly in the um, uh, agricultural sector. Mm -hmm. There is still a perspective to do more. And doing our job better means that there is uh, um, uh, that we can help to to um, prevently to to, uh, to act against um, terrorism against uh, extremists mm -hmm. in the and to, to go going to the root of it. So right. that is what we do with the SAL Alliance. And what is my SAL strategy? The SAL strategy means I'll not only put the focus on the G5 countries, but also on the coastal region mm -hmm. and look more on the on the problems and not only on the, the states. Mm -hmm. And I would just add to that to round out um, because your, your question was you know security, non-security. We believe that the best way forward, particularly with such a young population, is to tackle the drivers of insecurity yeah. and conflict yeah. before they're they're matured. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, as the minister said, job creation, investment in a brighter future, improving education, building the resilience of the institutions so the young people have faith in their government and their communities to be able to find a, a, a illicit or legal path forward as they make their way through the world. And that is what we're, from a development perspective, mm -hmm. tackling uh, or at least approaching. Yeah. Yeah. We both think that development policy is a component of, of, of a preventive, of a, um, a sustainable uh, security policy. Mm -hmm. So that yep. is what we both have in, in common. Yeah. You hear that a lot in Washington as well. Yes. Yeah. National security yeah. and development yeah. uh, being interlinked. So much as Africa is important to us at the Council, uh, we do want to spend uh, at least five minutes discussing, or maybe four or five dis minutes discussing Ukraine before moving to yeah. the very good questions that are coming in. Um, there's been a bit of news today, uh, which is that uh, Belgium, uh, Kingdom of Belgium, has used some of the interest from blocked Russian reserves to send money directly to Ukraine. Uh, this is new. Not very much money, nothing to, no, no comparison with 300 billion, but a lot of it has ended up in, in Belgium for nerdy geoeconomic reasons we don't need to go into. Uh, and they are starting to break this precedent of using some of Russia's assets to send them to Ukraine. Uh, this will not be enough, uh, and hopefully we will see Russia eventually engaging with in a negotiation which would see it pay reparations, but you know, that, that is really just wishful thinking at this point. So there is an effort ongoing at this point to support Ukraine bilaterally, and there's a reconstruction effort. Yep. So I'm curious, uh, first of all, in your thoughts, Ambassador McKee, on what the U.S. is doing, and then briefly we'll come to you, Minister. Mm. Um, sure. So... Uh, we are laser focused, and you mentioned moving towards recovery and, and ultimately reconstruction. It's, it's uh, fascinating that at any given time inside Ukraine right now, we're providing, my agency is providing humanitarian assistance for those that are either recently liberated or the internally displaced persons um, and other uh, challenges wrought by the conflict, as well as in other parts of the country. Uh, rebuilding uh, those re recently liberated territories um, and as the Ukrainians would say building it back better um, <clears throat> uh, the term didn't stick so much here in the US but they have certainly adopted it wholesale um, and it's exactly yeah. exactly um, but we see this as fundamental that that with the uh, tremendous amount of security assistance alongside that the economic recovery and the humanitarian assistance has to happen so that the government of Ukraine can govern and that they can not only win the war but win the peace and that means laying the foundation for a vibrant uh, transparent, corrupt, free uh, democracy that they are fighting so hard for and that is at, actually at the core of Putin's aggression. And so our, we believe our foreign assistance is a critical tool to realize Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic aspirations, including EU accession. 
Um, in terms of money and what we've done to date, and then I just want to jump to, as you said, the numbers. I'm not going to talk about everything the U.S. has provided. Um, it's, a, it's significant, but we're not alone, um, both bilaterally um, and, uh, th you know, multilaterally. But uh, the, the community of nations that have rallied to support Ukraine, both in the security uh, assistance space, but also in the economic recovery or stability at this point. Um, and certainly when Putin weaponized winter and we saw the attacks on the civilian grid and the mobilization of resources from Australia, Japan, Korea, the EU, mm. uh, neighboring nations, uh, member states that weren't part of the EU yet but but are have aspirations and, and are marching toward that has been phenomenal. So our challenge is to keep that up. Um, to keep that unity of purpose and those resources uh, uh, prioritized. Um, and because, and then here's how I'm going to throw you out some numbers. Um, we you believe. Love numbers. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Um, <laughs> so we see, and what we're immediately reacting to right now is to help Ukraine uh, uh, start generating revenue again. This will reduce their dependency on direct budget support and donor, uh, you know, macroeconomic uh, stability resources. It also restores, when you focus on livelihoods, particularly in the agricultural sector, but elsewhere, it helps those that were uh, affected by the war, which is frankly the entire country, regain their, their sense of agency and their ability to resume uh, life and livelihood and nothing uh, you know, restores dignity more than being able to put your own food on the table and uh, take care of your family on your own. And so that is a top priority of the government of Ukraine and one that we've responded to. So both from a revenue generation perspective, but also from a human perspective. Um, and so economic, uh, increasing economic exports and trade um, is critical to Ukraine's economic recovery. And the World Bank's rapid uh, damage and needs assessment highlights that direct damage, direct damage has uh, exceeded over 135 billion, while the depressed economy and production as a result of Putin's aggression uh, has equated to over $290 billion in losses. And so currently, as of this moment, and it only grows every day, uh, the total recovery needs are in excess of $411 billion. Um, and these vast sums tell us, and this is circling back to the point you raised earlier, Minister, and that we know is fundamentally true, current and planned support from all donors will be insufficient. We need to partner and marshal additional resources across Germany, the EU, or other international partners, including and fundamentally including the private sector um, to address Ukraine's extensive recovery needs. And so we are laser focused on that as we move ahead. Thank you for that. Um, Minister, it's very good you're in Washington because it's not always known in Washington, not because accusing Ambassador McKee of anything, but some other people, it's okay. not always known how much bilateral help the uh, EU and individual member states have sent to mm. Ukraine. This is uh, sometimes underestimated. Yeah. Uh, so a little bit perhaps from you on what Germany and the EU are doing on Ukraine, and then we'll move to questions. Mm. And we, we do a lot over the, the last months now. Um, mm -hmm. uh, everybody hopes that Putin stopped that war, but uh, it is not seen now that he will stop it. So we need to rebuild Ukraine. Yeah, not, not later on, not after the war. We, do, right. we need to do that now. And that means uh, building houses for all the people who, who are IDPs in their own country, um, repair the water system, repair um, the energy supply, uh, help uh, to uh, have a health system that is able to deal with all the problems uh, that the people in Ukraine have at the moment. And that means uh, they also need people who help uh, the children with this trauma, uh, with all the problems they have now. So we really do a lot also on, on, on the European level, on the German level. Um, in my ministry, in the last 12 months, we have 700 and 670 million just for building houses, water supply, energy system. And that is only one part of what Germany is doing of, uh, to help Ukraine. And it is important uh, to help Ukraine um, to, to do that also in the next months and to establish um, a, a, new, a new, new build Ukraine, a sustainable Ukraine uh, for, for all the people who are still in Ukraine and the ones who also want to go back. Yep. That we see uh, in, in Germany that, that is near the border, so people go back to Ukraine in the war. Um, 
uh, they need they need houses and they need places where they can go. All right, a few seconds. I, I would just like to add a, a, a quick anecdote to this point. Uh, I was in Bucharest a couple of weeks ago to talk about um, increasing capacity of the solidarity lanes to get the grain out mm -hmm. and and hopefully um, uh, to those most in need. Um, but also energy, right? And energy stability is critical both for Europe and going forward. It's come up a few times. And when I was speaking with the Minister of Transport, he said, I said, I thanked him for how much Romania was leaning in and supporting. And he, and he said, it's not philanthropic, right? We're not, I mean, it, yes, it's the right thing to do, but we're not doing this because it's the right thing to do. It's that if Ukraine fails, we're next. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so we're going to move on to questions after that. Uh, Daunting uh, yes. statement. Um, a few questions, quick fire for you, Minister Schulze, from some of our audience members. Uh, first of all, on uh, so-called triangular cooperation. Um, about, uh, so a way to move uh, from north-south cooperation and south-south cooperation being separate and bringing them together. What do you see as the ideal vehicle for that? Is, the, is it the G20 or is it something else? Mm. A, a, brief, a brief answer would be appreciated, although I, I appreciate it's a difficult question. And then a, a somewhat cheeky question uh, on how things are with France uh, in your cooperation on Africa. Uh, as one of our audience members has noticed there have been a lot of meetings, but not necessarily that many results announced. So uh, triangular <laughs> cooperation and German-French cooperation. Yeah. Uh, I think triangle corporations are very, very good. That that brings corporations forward, and, and we should do that where we we are able to do so. Uh, I think <laughs> our question is a renewed multilateralism, and we need to do more with more states together and uh, um, bringing forward the international organizations like the World Bank, like uh, the UN system they are able to bring together such corporations. And I think that is a good idea, uh, having such corporations. We are much stronger together. We all know that. But we don't act in that way because it is also, it makes a lot of work to, to do so, to work together in that way. So um, the second question, France. Uh, we, we have a close cooperation with France. We meet a lot of time. We do things together. And in, in, not in every region and it's good to, to work together because of our history. Uh, we have a, another uh, colonial history as uh, France has. So in some parts, it's better to uh, the European step in, that Germany steps in, and in other regions, we work together. Um, what, uh, what, what is the best for the regions and the best for the partner? Uh, that is what we are doing, but uh, we work strongly together with, with France uh, wherever, we, is it, wherever it's possible. I'm going to tie, try to tie many of these questions together. Um, they mention um, civil society and bringing partners together, but civil society and academics, how your ministries engage with knowledgeable expert voices and also influential voices on the ground, uh, whether you're trying to do more on this. So to give you an example, um, unions. Uh, unions are defending, who, who may have similar opinions to you on defending labor rights in the countries that you're trying to assist. Um, whether you've engaged with them in the past and whether you're trying to do that a little bit more. I think several of our, our participants are quite curious. So maybe we can start with you, Mr. Schulze. Yeah. I think civil society is a key for working together. It's a key to get all the people on board who are engaged all over the world. And it is a key to get the people in the countries, in the developing countries on board, because they there are really, really important civil society work. Uh, uh, I am um, um, massively engaged with women. We have a feminist development approach, so we try to give women a, a voice, uh, bring them into the projects, uh, having resources, representation, rights for women. Um, so I know that there are a lot of really, really tough women in the world, so um, having them in the project, uh, that brings the project forward and makes it more sustainable. Um, working together with unions, uh, uh, that is uh, here, uh, uh, we do that together with the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. And Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Yes, kindly co sponsoring this event. Yes, uh -huh. <laughs> they do a lot to bring unions forward to, to take into account that in a lot of our development countries, most of the people are not working officially, they work in an unofficial way. And so having a union 
uh, that also take care for take for, take care for that workers and in an unofficial um, uh, working conditions, uh, having other conditions every day. That is the work uh, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung is doing all over the world, and they they uh, help unions to to get together, to build, um, uh, to to um, join their forces, to uh, grow, and that is an important work to build a society that you have a union on and on. on. So it is important. To add, Ambassador McKay? I would say civil society is fundamental to our work and not exclusively in sort of what you would characterize as a democracy and governance mm -hmm. space. Um, they are closest to the community. They represent the voices of uh, the people. And for us to not listen and support, particularly local civil society okay. organizations, then our development uh, efforts uh, won't endure or be sustained. It's, it's just good development practice to put uh, the the ownership and and directionality of meeting the greatest needs on the ground into the hands of those organizations that know it best. So thank you very much, both of you. Um, this has been very comprehensive. We've covered a lot of ground. Uh, sadly, we didn't get to go to all of the questions, though I mm. did try to bring them all together in that last one. Um, and so the lesson from this session is that there are a lot of people you have to engage with. Uh, there are a lot of different governments that need to cooperate. Uh, seems that the US and Germany are quite like-minded on most of these topics. So it's very good that you're here, Minister. We hope to see you again soon. Um, and uh, a few notes on not necessarily housekeeping, but things coming in the coming few months. Um, the GE Economic Center will be traveling to Marrakesh for the um, Bretton Woods Institutions meeting that will be there. Uh, this year in October. So we'll be working on quite a lot of these issues to do with Bretton Woods reform, uh, keeping the multilateral development banking system open but uh, fit for purpose in the 21st century. So watch this space. Um, the Europe Center uh, is helping us a lot on our work on transatlantic cooperation. There are a lot of interesting conversations at the Atlantic Council to do with TTC, um, not necessarily a development issue, but one that's very close to our hearts. So also watch that space. And finally, uh, thank you to our participants. Thank you, Ambassador McKee. Thank you, uh, Minister Schulze. Thank you also to our own Rama Yan for helping me a little bit to get the African questions. That's right. Absolutely. Um, and thank you to all of you for participating. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.